All right, just a reminder, this afternoon, yeah, I guess, well, maybe not this afternoon, but I just made some of you nervous. After the service this morning, there will be a meeting for those interested in the Honduran, uh, Honduras mission trip, medical mission trip. So if you're a medical professional and interested, there's a meeting right after this in the choir room. That's right behind the stained glass here. Just walk out either side here to the call uh, small group classroom and uh, you'll get your information there. Then a reminder for those who are checking out Financial Peace University, uh, it'll be at four o'clock below us here in the fellowship hall. It will be done by the evening worship time. Who has a guest they'd like to introduce to us this, this morning? Go ahead, Daphne. Welcome, Megan. We're glad you're here. <laughs> Bobby Austin, who do you have? Welcome, Vince of Valley. Thank you. <laughs> Who else? Who else has a guest they'd like to introduce this morning? Oh, I almost called you. You were waving at someone. That's funny. Anyone else? <laughs> I was scratching my ear, preacher. Leave me alone. Anyone else? All right, go ahead, Sarah. Welcome, Dad and Stepmom. <laughs> Anyone else? In town, out of town, first time, first time in a long time, any guests? Okay, let's see here. Where are Stephen and Annie Griffin? Would you stand, please? This is Stephen and Annie Griffin. They have uh, professed faith in Jesus. They have been immersed in baptism waters, and they have completed starting point, and they are presenting themselves before you for church membership. Welcome with me, Stephen and Annie Griffin. <laughs> you be seated. Yeah. And uh, we'll be voting on them tonight in our monthly business meeting, okay? And just keep stipulating that, because no extra business meetings, right? And then, is Judith Jackman in here today? Judith, wave at me. I haven't shaken hands with you personally, but okay, maybe, okay, no, I don't see her. But then also, let's see if we have, uh, yeah, Sharon Looney is, where are you at? Stan, please, and Daphne, her daughter, please stand. They are returning to us for church membership. They have both professed faith in Christ, been immersed in water, and have a completed starting point. And again, they'll be voted on this evening. So welcome them with me. All right. If it's your first time here, and, or first time in a while, and you couldn't get anyone courageous enough to introduce you, you have one of these things in your worship guide. That's what the cool kids call the bulletin, okay? So if you, if you would please fill this out, that would be a great help to me. I'll get to know you. There'll be less of me asking you your name. And um, then I can also check and see what you thought about the service this morning. And then on the back, you can also sign up for the men's prayer breakfast. That's this uh, Saturday at 730. And you can sign up for our membership class. It'll be the first Sunday of February. And you can sign up to donate blood the day after that, first week of February. You can do all those things on the back of your connection card or submit a prayer request for the pastors to pray about on Tuesday, the church to pray over on our church prayer meeting on a Wednesday. All right, let's pray. Lord, thanks for the opportunity to worship with your people this morning in your house. Thank you for all the work that's gone into this worship service. And uh, Lord, all the work that will be shown here with our music, and we thank you for the preaching that will follow. Thank you for the prayers that will be prayed. Thank you for the studying that has been done in the previous hour. Thank you for the good class that I had with Midway and the good teaching that Brother David Barham and, and the stars and the Barhams all do in their Sunday morning and evening. Thank you for the great class we had of those young disciples of Christ and the parents that they represent. Thank you so much for what you're doing here at Sandy Ridge. I pray that you glorify yourself in the worship and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Angie? Please stand as we sing There's Power in the Blood. From your burden of sin, there's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. 
my heart will sing no other name Jesus Jesus my heart will sing no other name Jesus Jesus play through that one more time just 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 part of it just for a minute let's all bow our heads talk to the Lord tell him what you need today come to him in Jesus name you let him lead surrender to him What is it that he wants from you? This is not a cute Bible study time. This is God doing his work with his people. And I pray that you'll be submissive to him and strong in his, in his presence. Let's have our ushers come, please. Let's have our ushers come. Brother Zach Baumgartner, will you join me up here, please? Oh, let me borrow your microphone if you don't mind. It doesn't come up here, does it? Huh? Thank you. This is Brother Zach Baumgartner. He and his wife, uh, Stephanie, have been coming here for maybe six or eight months, but maybe, maybe it's a little, is it six months? Maybe. maybe. I, I really look up to you. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> And uh, they joined our church just a few months ago, and I wanted you to get a chance to meet them. They're working with Zach a little bit in the youth, and they are also a part of the Calls a Small Group, at least I think. And, uh, and anyway, you go ahead and be seated. It's safe now. All the ushers are out. We know there's no tripping hazards now for them. And uh, Brother Zach, would you ask God to bless the offering? And then we'll hear one more song, and, and uh, we'll take offerings and then hear from the Word. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we just come to you this morning in this time of uh, offering. Lord, we just ask that uh, you would bless what we give back to you, Lord, knowing that it was all yours in the first place. Uh, God, I pray that uh, this time wouldn't be out of uh, a, a box to check for us, Lord, but it would be a reflection of our heart uh, and a gratefulness to you, Lord. We just uh, we pray that um, Pastor Bill's message this morning would, uh, would touch hearts in here this morning, Lord. We just ask that uh, you begin preparing those hearts, Lord, and uh, that soul that's nearest hell this morning, Lord, that they would just, that this would be the day, uh, that this would be the day that they surrendered uh, their life to you and entered the kingdom of God, Lord, we just, uh, we ask all these things in your name I pray, amen. So 
cornerstone, is solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter. Please stand with us. as we prepare to receive your word, I ask that your spirit would pierce our hearts, would open our eyes, would open our understanding, Lord, so that we would take in all that you have for us this morning. Lord, and my prayer is that we don't leave this place unchanged. May you speak to our hearts and convict us of the things that we need to change in our lives to glorify you more. Please go before us and um, bless your word. May it go forth with your power. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Please look in the book of Mark, chapter number 12, please. And the only thing worth talking about this morning, God's Word. Mark, chapter number 12. This evening, in our evening service, we'll begin our 
study on end times, particularly Mark chapter 13. We will not be covering Mark chapter 13 on Sunday mornings. Let me say that again. We will not be covering Mark chapter 13 on Sunday morning. You say, what's wrong with it? Nothing. That's the problem, is that it's just not Sunday morning material just yet. And I'll have time tonight for questions after what we speak about. And then, as an added bonus, I have to be done by the business meeting. So there's, <laughs> there'll be no overtime in tonight's message. Uh, but anyways, Mark chapter number 12, just a reminder. Next slide, please. You might, uh, you might, <laughs> you might uh, see that just, and I thought I stuck my little laser point. Wait a minute, wait a minute, where'd it go? Hang on, it's up here in this flea market. All right, hang on, there, wonderful. See that? Wow. I thought I, I, thought I put it out of my uh, desk drawer downstairs, but I put breath mints instead. Um, there are worse things. There are worse things to put in your pocket than breath mints, amen? But I'm glad I have this, too. All right, so anyway, here is uh, Jerusalem. Let's take the next slide. And uh, our passage today comes from Jerusalem. This is Jerusalem about the time of Jesus. All that we have read last week, and really weeks before that, I mean, before Christmas, uh, we talked about things that happen in and around this temple. The temple, you'll notice, this is the eastern wall of Jerusalem. You'll notice that the temple shares the east wall of Jerusalem. So when I pointed out that Jesus uh, was uh, coming into the temple on several straight days and coming in the east side of Jerusalem, it's because Bethany is over here on the drywall. By the way, we'll mention this a little bit later in our business meeting tonight, our plans for this portion of the wall and that. This is not just to be a placeholder for Bethany. There are plans for this part of the wall. Anyways, here, Jesus comes in from Bethany over the Mount of Olives and into the temple of Jerusalem. Next slide, please. And this is the eastern gate here. You'll notice when they approached Jerusalem, they had to either come up this ramp into the east gate, which also brought them not only into the city, but into the temple, but they could also have taken this bridge entrance into the eastern, into the eastern temple. So the, uh, an eastern gate of the city, which is also the eastern gate of the temple. So a lot of what we've looked at, okay, you can leave that up there because I think that's the last slide. Okay, thank you. So Mark chapter 12, we intended on, on covering all of this last week. I don't know how, but when I ran out of time, my father-in-law, who is also a pastor, says, preaching is like baloney. And I got real nervous at that point. He says, you cut it off anywhere. It's still baloney. And so... In other words, the sermon can be cut off just about anywhere, and it'll still be a sermon, all right? I don't know if I'm quite that carefree about it, but I know you can't picture me being a little uptight about someone's definition on something, but anyway, I digress. Um, so Mark chapter number 12, we see that, you know, the questions begin in chapter 11 with a question about authority from the chief priests and the elders and the scribes. Chapter 12 then, particularly in verse 13, has the second question of the day. The Pharisees and the Herodians asking Jesus questions about taxes. He flips it. It becomes a lesson on ownership. And then the third question of the day came from some Sadducees in verse 18. They asked Jesus about uh, who gets to marry or whose wife will this woman be who wasn't able to have children with seven brothers. <laughs> Anyways, moving on. You need to listen to that or listen to our series on Ruth to see how, how in-depth. Anyways, so that's, and then our fourth question is asked in verse 28. One of the scribes came. I want you to know the heart of your pastor tonight, and as if it's not on display enough, I want you to be aware that this was not a passage that I was coming to with a whole lot of glee. It's because it's so well known. It's so well known, and you know I don't like to talk about things that are predictable. I like to be very unpredictable up here. I think part of the value of preaching is shock. I think that if I can make you mad, sad, or glad, I'm successful. I don't think there's anything worse than being negligible or forgettable. So I think that Jesus really is my co-pilot in that methodology. I think he taught us well that you ought to say things and question things in a way that they are memorable. So when I come to a passage where that doesn't look possible, because everyone has heard these verses, I must admit I was not really 
excited to preach them. And then last week I didn't fit it in. So now I'm leaving the passage thinking, oh, I got to pick it up at the very same place this coming week. What do I do? Well, I stay faithful, believing that God makes no mistakes and that his word is wonderful the way it's written and that we can get something out of it and not just something, but what he intended. So what I mean to tell you today is that God intends for you to hear what you're about to hear. And I pray that you'll pray for me to be faithful to his word. As a matter of fact, the reality is we're not even going to be able to cover the entirety of these verses before us. So one of the scribes came. And the scribes came knowing he couldn't stump Jesus on authority, couldn't stump Jesus on taxes, couldn't stump Jesus on the teaching of end times. So let's try something a little simpler. Verse 28 Perceiving that he was a good answerer, he asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? Now, I don't know about you, but if you were to answer that, wouldn't you think about one of the Ten Commandments? I mean, seriously, if you didn't know what you've always been taught, that is that the Pharisees had developed over 600 rules off of the Ten Commandments, wouldn't you go to one of the Ten Commandments for your pick of the day? I would. Like, uh, I'll be honest with you, I have a particular recoil when I hear people take God's name in vain. I hate it. You know what I mean? Exodus 20, verse 7, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who has taken his name in vain. I have a real problem with people that take the Lord's name in vain. And we have a lot of Christianized versions of that in our church. But that's not the point of my sermon, so I won't even mention about how we say, Oh, Lord. Anyways, I won't even say anything about that. What would be your pet commandment? Probably the pet commandment that you would pick, the one that I would pick, is the one that we're probably not guilty of. I mean, right? We probably, I mean, probably many of us would quote, thou shalt not make it of the any graven image. <laughs> I mean, does anyone in here have a shrine to a Jobu doll from their time in India? Probably not. So we would say that's probably the greatest commandment. That's right in the face of God. You have a God crafted out of your own hands. And we have lots of application for that commandment. And so it works, but that's not what Jesus said. Jesus didn't say anything about the Sabbath day. You keep it holy or honoring your father and mother. All of them are good commands. And probably the 500 or rather the 300 and some that were do nots and the 200 and some that were do's that came out of these 10 commandments would have made good answers, probably a lot of them would have. They were the ones that the scribes, the Sadducees, the Pharisees developed. Because they didn't want you to get close to disobeying the commands, and so we put hedges before the ditch. We want you to run into the hedge before you run into the ditch. And so we put a hedge in front of the ditch. Uh, we would grant you that it's a little painful to ride your bike full speed into a bush. But it's even more uncomfortable to ride it into a ditch. And so they would make a hedge for you to run into. It's not fun. No one wants to do it. How many of you would agree it's a painful day when you drive into a branch? However, however, the scribes and Pharisees then turned the hedges into the ditch, and then they need hedges for the hedges because they didn't want you breaking the law that kept you from breaking the law. And so what does Jesus do? Because th the reality is, folks, a lot of the time, you and I feel closer to God when we keep rules. We just do. If I can keep rules, then I'm a good child of God. Just like, you know, when we were raised in our parents' home, if we could keep a rule, we were a good kid. And Jesus goes beyond that, and I need you to hear me today. It's going to take some work because this is such an overused text. So this is what Jesus answered in verse 29. The first of all the commandments is, and he quotes from the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He's quoting out of Deuteronomy. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And I am so sure, brothers and sisters, that we cannot take part two this morning, that whenever I'm done preaching part one, we'll close the service. The reality is that if I gave us two things to think about, I know my own heart, I know my own mind, and if you're, if you're honest, you probably know yours, at least in part. 
And you'd be willing to say that if I focused on one or two, you would focus on the other. In our shortcomings, we typically talk about how good we are at something else. Yeah, I'm not that great of a listener, but I work hard. Yeah, I'm not that great of a provider, but I'm not immoral. Yeah, I don't do so well in my prayer life, but I love Bible studies. You know what I mean? Anyone? I was wondering if I had the network with me this morning. That's a Verizon joke. It's a Verizon joke, okay? <laughs> this, this is really important because we might think that we would focus on heart, soul, mind, strength in verse 30 as if there is this laundry list. Okay, do I love them with my brain? Do I love them with my emotions? Do I love them with my, my soul? Do I love them? Do I, and the reality is we're going to find a real problem if we try to break up all the pieces of you and me and see, do I love God with my mind? Let me think through that. And honestly, uh, I've preached 108 sermons through the Gospel of Matthew at a previous church, and that's exactly how I preached this passage in that, in that series. What does it mean to love God with your mind? What does it mean to love God with your heart? Th the problem is that Paul calls us a trichotomy, body, soul, spirit. Moses calls us a dichotomy. God breathed into man the breath of life, and he became a living soul. He's a soul. He doesn't have a soul. So, so does Moses disagree with Paul because Moses says we have two parts, Paul says we have three parts, and now here's Mark, still the word of God, yes, saying that we have four parts, and then I think Luke's version even adds a fifth. Is that the idea here is for you to walk away from here thinking I have five parts to me and now I need to find out if I love God with all of them? No, I don't think so. Because of the fact that it's so imprecise in other portions of scripture, I don't think that the God of heaven who penned this scripture wanted you to walk away from here itemizing the parts of your life to see whether or not you love them totally with your blood pumping muscle or the seat of your emotions, the heart, or with your mind or your brain. I think we need to love God with our minds. I think we need to focus on focusing. This hasn't helped anything. I think we need to focus on doing one thing at a time. I think we need to focus on listening to people when they're speaking to us. I think we need to focus on talking to people and looking them in the face when we're speaking to them. I think we need to focus on preaching when it's being done. I think we need to do a lot of things a little better with our minds, but I don't think that's the point of the passage because of the reasons just stated. With all of our strength, how many of you are a little tired of going to places of business where they treat you like you're an inconvenience because you're a customer? Uh, maybe you've never been to a fast food restaurant. I don't know. But that person behind the cash register doesn't own the joint. And it's pretty clear. <sighs> what can I get you? No pickle. All right. Hang on. We don't particularly care, probably not at your fast food restaurant, certainly not yours, but no fast food restaurants have that problem that you're associated with, only the ones that I visit, okay? And certainly not the one where they say our pleasure. Not at all. But have you ever been to a business where you struggle to find someone that takes things seriously and does them with their whole strength? Certainly that's a need. Certainly we ought to be fervent in everything we do, yes? Our devotion life, our prayer life, our work habits. It would be wonderful for Christians to be known for their work ethic sure would but that's not the point of this passage you know out of the in the greek language where this was written it says out of the whole heart out of the whole soul out of the whole mind out of the whole strength in other words everything that's in you just pull it out and love to god all of you love the lord your god with all of you everything that's in you everything you have everything you are and uh, the reality is, this is not easy. We wonder, can we love God with our emotions, for example? <sighs> Think through this. God is emotional. We are talking about the God that said in Genesis 6, he was sorry that he made man. Yes? We are talking about a God who had a son who wept at his friend's tomb. We are talking about a God who, in Psalm 2, 4, laughs at the people on planet Earth seeking to unseat him. 
Our God is emotional. Our God is intellectual. Our God is volitional. Our God is creational. Everything that you feel, even in our fallen state, the things that we feel, the things that we want to succeed at, we want to do well at them because we're made in the image of a God who is perfect in all of those facets. And it is wonderful to know that you and I have a license to be emotional and strong and fervent and intellectual and volitional. We do not check our brains at the door when we become Christians. We can take all of us and love all of God. And that, I believe, is the point of this passage. But that is really difficult to flesh out if we don't put some handles on it. You see, if I told someone in this room, well, let's flip the tables. If you came to me and said, Pastor Bill, I love you, except your face. <laughs> yeah, bless him, Lord. He'll take some blessing to make up for this face. Huh. Some of you have wonderful looking beards. You men, men, men have some good looking beards. Good morning, turning your Bibles to Mark chapter 12. <laughs> I would probably grow a beard if it didn't look like I had the mange when I tried it. He come up to me, I love everything about you, Bill, except your preaching. I love everything about you except your manners. I love everything about you except the way that you call me when I miss three, four, five, six weeks in a row. I love everything about you except the way that you say no sometimes. I love everything about you except when you say things like, hey, let's do this as a church. See, it doesn't feel so loving when we start adding qualifiers, right? Now, how would it have been if I, I was a 20-year-old man when I proposed to my 17-year-old wife? And so that means that, I've told you this before, but some of you are new here, and I just... Uh, you know, we had to go to the courthouse, and our mom had to sign for us to get a marriage license the day before our wedding. And we were married with two children at 21 and 18. We got started a little young. We had to learn a little bit about love in the process. But, you know, I thought I knew what love was, but can you imagine when I proposed to my wife, all romantic and such, at a buffet on a Sunday? And I would have said... <laughs> Sweetheart, I love you with my whole heart. Except for the way you talk. <laughs> and so it does no good for us to talk about how much we love God when there are things, quite frankly, about him we don't love. So let me, let me just ask you if maybe you've considered the fact that to love God with our whole hearts our whole souls, our whole minds, our whole strengths. And again, those are not meant to be parsed and divided and analyzed. When we say we love God with all of us, with all of our gusto, every calorie pushed in the direction of our affections, oh, what a good word, affections for God. Do, do we know that that means that we love a lot of things about him that are counter to our nature? For example, when we say we love God with all of us, we're saying that we love all of him with all of us. With all of me, God, I love all of you. Is that true about you? Is it true that you love God's holiness? Is it true that, you know, do I love that he is nothing like me? Do, do I love that, do, do I take delight in his otherness? Otherness. Do, do I find my heart, soul, mind, strength taking delight in how my heavenly Father knows nothing about my, about, about experiencing, hear, hear me well, I'm not saying he doesn't feel it, doesn't say he doesn't know it, but do I love the fact that my heavenly Father is not fickle like me? Do I love the fact that my heavenly Father is not inadequate like me? So the law is never a motivator. 
We, we make more rules. It doesn't motivate people. It, 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 it quickens their rebellion. But, but like I've said before, in many settings, when the Holy Spirit doesn't govern us, we make up rules. And so sometimes the rules keep us safe, but only until the Holy Spirit becomes the boss in our lives. In other words, there's what we have to do, and then there's what God moves us to do, which, oh, by the way, is in keeping with his law. But when we start with a law, it is not a motivator. There are some in this room today you have, honestly, if you're taking inventory, there's nothing inside of you that loves God because you have still the old, unregenerate heart. And that is why 1 John 5 describes you. His laws are painfully grievous because you don't particularly love God. Can you imagine walking up to anyone? How about you go to your boss tomorrow? And you go to your boss, whoever it is, probably everyone in this room works for somebody. And even if you own your business, you work for your customer. And if you, if you don't think you do, try without customers. You go up to them, I'm thankful for this work, but I think your laws stink. But I love you. And honestly, we're not motivated by, by the law. The law doesn't motivate us. We have to find something different. We have to find that 1 John 4 reality. We love him because he first loved us. And that is why many people never extend forgiveness to others is because they have never experienced forgiveness. They don't extend grace to others because they have never been a recipient of grace. They don't, quite frankly, love anybody because they have never experienced Calvary love. It's really important that we get this. If, if we're always kicking, as Acts chapter 9 says, if we're always kicking at the goats, young men in the balcony, I don't even want to look at you straight. I don't want to embarrass you. Put your stuff away and pay attention. You will remember every bit of this at the judgment. Do we have any love for the quality of sinlessness that God has? Do we see that this is taking God's team against us? When we say we love God's holiness, we're saying, God, you're right, I'm not. Whatever you say about me, it's true. I'll change. You help me. That is loving God's holiness. Picture with me, please, with our current understanding of salvation in America. Please hear me. Picture a heaven full of people that really don't love God. They just didn't want to go to hell. Does that sound like a place you'd like to be forever? A place where no one loves God because they just had to pray a prayer to go to heaven? That is salvation in America. A salvation where we do no changing, we don't allow God to do any changing, we experience no life-changing love, no grace, not you, not us, everyone else. I'm talking about, facetiously, I'm talking about everyone else. But certainly, there's someone in this room today, you have gone through the motions, but you have not experienced the love of God, and quite frankly, you don't love God, some of you, one of you, maybe none of you, but probably at least one. You don't love God, and you surely don't love His holiness. How can we say we love God and we don't love things about Him? I, I must tell you, there is a real proof that there's a God in heaven when I think about how unlovely I am towards people sometimes. Because I know he is the standard and I am not. Does it bother you that I tell you so much about me? I want you to know that you're not dealing with a canonized saint up here. Every week I'm bothered about me. You see, I, I don't like you. We're in good company. There's days I don't like me. And the idea here is, do we love God enough where we love his holiness? Secondly, do I love God's justice? Do I love his justice? Do I love God's sense of justice? Not mine, God's. If we find out that a man was in, in jail for 15 years for a crime that his daughter committed, after she denied it, he confessed to it to protect her, we would say that justice requires that the man is released and that the daughter serves the rest of her time. At least the remainder of her time. 
Why is it that we have such a sense of justice, but we expect that God has no such standards, and if he does, they're at least as low and as attainable as ours? Surely, if God dislikes something, he only dislikes what I dislike. Surely if God wants something, he only wants what I want. No, brothers and sisters, that is, that is endemic of the fact that we have made God like us and therefore have transgressed the second commandment. You'll make no other gods before me. I wish God was like me. Oh, no, you don't. He is all wise. Earlier this week, I was at a Christian school ball game. I must tell you, I felt safer in Baghdad. <laughs> and that's two years in a row where I've been to Christian school gymnasiums watching so-called Christian school kids playing a so-called Christian-spirited sport. And this isn't slamming Christian schools. I was from K-whatever to 12th grade. I was in Christian school. This is not pro-Christian school. This is not anti-Christian school. This is not pro-public school. This is not anti-public school. It's just a story. But I was in a Christian school ball game the other day. I saw an adult get on the ball court and confront a teenager. Can you picture this? During a basketball game, an adult gets up off the bleacher, walks onto the court, and gets in the face of a teenage boy. Did you know that I had a sense of justice rear up inside of me? Did you know that when that host pastor walked over and that host athletic director walked over, did you know that me and my friend Mr. Bursa were ready? Did you know that I had a sense of justice? Do, do you, does it bother you that God has a sense of justice? Does God have a sense of justice at all like ours? Or is it even better? Is it even more pure and more righteous? Do we love God's justice? Do we? I wonder if that was your teenage boy, would you have had a sense of justice? Would you have walked over and had a word with that adult male that decided to get in the face of your son during a basketball game? I'll bet you would have. Do you think that God is at least that good? Do you love the fact that he is? Do you love the fact that our God, who watched his son be beaten by perfect strangers and then killed, do you love the fact that he has enough justice to stand up for the disrepute brought to his son? Do you think that he's at least as good of a father as we are? 